Hi, my name is Brian Caffo, and this is the lecture on resampled inference in the statistical inference class. This is part of the Coursera Data Science series. Um, this class is co-taught with my collaborators, Jeff Leak and Roger Peng. We're all in the Department of Biostatistics at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. So uh, resampled by resampled inference, uh, I'm talking about things that are very at the heart of data scientists. And this is where you use your data to perform inference. So you, you try to make robust inferences. You try to um, do things in a, in, in a way that relies heavily on the data, the data that you have. So one of the famous ones uh, invented by Tukey is the so-called jackknife. Love the jackknife, especially because he came up with a really cool name for it. Um, so the jackknife is a tool for estimating, say, you know, standard errors and bias of estimators. And it's a handy little tool, like its, its name suggests. Um, in, in contrast, the bootstrap, which is the kind of equivalent of a, a, a giant workshop full of tools. Um, uh, so the, the jackknife and the bootstrap involve resampling data. That's sort of repeatedly creating new data sets from the original data. So um, what does the jackknife do? The jackknife is similar to cross-validation, but your goal is different than cross-validation. You're not validating a prediction error. You're using it to do things like calculate a standard error um, or bias. So the jackknife deletes each observation and calculates an estimate based on the remaining n minus one of them. And then it uses these estimates to do bias and standard error calculations. Note, no, we don't have to do these things for, for sample means because we know they're unbiased and we know what their standard errors are. Um, but for other things, it might be useful. Um, so uh, let's consider uh, the jackknife for some univariate data. Um, so let's let x1 to xn be a collection of data used to estimate a parameter of theta. And then let's let theta hat be the estimate based on the full data set. So maybe. Um, you know, just as for sake of argument, let's assume that theta hat is the mean, okay? And then let's let theta hat sub i be the estimate obtained by deleting observation i from the data set, and then theta bar be the average of the theta hat sub i's, okay? And the jackknife, so if you do this, the jackknife of estimate of bias is that guy. And you'll find if, if, if theta hat is exactly the sample mean, it works out to be the, the sensible estimate. Um, it winds up being zero. And um, if it's the standard error estimate is that guy, which again, if it's the sample mean, it works out to be something um, sensible. This, is the, this guy works out to be the deviance of the delete one estimates from the um, average of the delete one estimates. OK, so that's the jackknife. So um, I'm going to do the median. The median has kind of a famous historical context in terms of the jackknife and the bootstrap. So here's library using R. Um, data, father, son. My, I'm going to look at the son's height. N is the, the length of the data set. Theta is the median. Now I want an estimate of the bias and the standard error of the median. So my, I'm going to apply for 1 to N. I'm going to delete the ith observation and take the median. So my jk is a collection of delete one medians. My theta bar is my mean of the jks. And my bias estimate is that guy. And my standard error estimate is that guy. OK, so just directly implementing what we did. OK, so um, here is our bias estimate. Let me get my thing. Here's our bias estimate, 0. And here is our standard error estimate. We can do this using the bootstrap package. We just say jackknife our data, the median. And then I assign that to a value temp, and I just grab the bias and the standard error because I only wanted to print them out. And of course, those are, are the same as what we saw before. So both methods, um, of course, yield the same answers as before. Um, however, um, odd little fact, the jackknife estimate of the bias for the median is always zero when the number of observations is even, even though the median isn't unbiased then. So, um, so we need something better, and that's where the bootstrap comes in for this, for this case. Um, so it's been shown that the jackknife is a linear approximation of the bootstrap. Um, and so in general, don't use the jackknife for sample quantiles like the median. 
it's been shown to have some poor properties, but otherwise the jackknife is a nice handy little tool. Um, I think people have taken that result, which is that the jackknife um, kind of fails in, in these highly specific instances and condemned it as a procedure as a whole, which is maybe a little bit unfair because it's a, it's a pretty quick little thing to do. Um, so there's another way to think about the jackknife in terms of these so-called pseudo-observations. Um, so we could create these pseudo-observations like this right here. And you can think of these as whatever observation i contributes to the estimate of theta. Um, so when, when theta is the sample mean, the pseudo-observations turn out to be the data themselves, by the way. Um, the sample standard error of these observations is the um, estimated standard error from the jackknife. So, um, and then the, the, the mean of these observations is a, is a bias corrected estimate of theta. So it's nice to think in terms of these pseudo observations um, as a way of thinking about the jackknife. Now let's talk about the big gun, right? So the bootstrap. Bootstrap is probably one of the most important tools ever discovered in statistics. So the bootstrap, it's a tremendously useful tool for constructing confidence intervals and calculating standard errors for difficult statistics. Um, you know, as an example, before we saw the jackknife didn't appear to work very well, how do we get a confidence interval for the median? Um, and so the bootstrap procedure follows the so-called bootstrap principle. So what's the bootstrap principle? Um, uh, you might also wonder wh where does the bootstrap gets, get its name? So this is this idea of pulling oneself up from their own bootstrap, um, right? So, so I mean, bootstrap. I mean, they they literally mean like you know like that little thing on a boot right there, right? And obviously, you can't pull yourself um, up from your own bootstraps. Um, and this is a, from a famous story, uh, the Adventures of Baron Munchausen, where the person, the story goes, the person claimed that they. Um, pulled themselves from the bottom of the sea by pulling themselves on, uh, on their own bootstrap. Um, there's this great, um, uh, there's this great uh, movie version of the adventures of Baron Munchausen. So in honor of the bootstrap, you should go see that as a homework assignment. Um, so at any rate, um, the bootstrap, the, the bootstrap is in a sense unfortunately named because it's suggesting it's doing something impossible. But in fact, you know, the bootstrap works off of the so-called bootstrap principle. And uh, suppose that I have a statistic that estimates some population parameter, but I don't know its sampling distribution. So what I mean by that is, for example, take the sample average. We know its sampling distribution. We know that it's normal, um, you know, mu kind of uh, sigma over sigma squared over n um, uh, for large n. Right, if if the data are IID, we know that that, that that's going to be approximately right for large n, um, and we know um, that that get rid of the normality, that part's always right. Um, so we now know a lot about the sampling distribution of x bar, but for most statistics, we don't know that. So the bootstrap principle suggests using the distribution defined by the data to approximate the sampling distribution of a complicated statistic. So so think about it this way. Um, um, Imagine if we could resample averages over and over again from normal mu sigma squared o over n. So let's imagine that, that we were new to statistics and we didn't know that for large n uh, averages tended to follow that distribution um, via the central limit theorem. And some of them were to allow us to repeatedly sample averages. If we did a histogram, we would know what the sampling distribution looked like if we were allowed to resample averages. Um, and then we could use that to create confidence intervals and tests and all these things we've used the central limit theorem for. But on the other hand, no one allows us to sample from the sampling distribution. We only get one average. Well, the bootstrap says, well, why don't we resample from our observed data, um, you know, drawing with replacement from our observed data, and use that to resample. And then that's kind of like getting read averages given to us from the true distribution, kind of like it, but not exactly like it. Um, so in practice, the bootstrap is always carried out by simulation. Um, and we're only going to cover a, a, a small set of bootstrap in practice. 
Um, so the general procedure follows by simulating complete data sets from the observed data with replacement. And the, the idea is that, okay, well, we don't know what the true distribution of the observed data is, so why don't we just treat each data point as having probability 1 over n and just sample IID from the data set itself. So this means that we're putting, we're putting all the observations in a bag and we're pulling them out but the, and, and logging them, but then we're putting them back in. We're allowing a number, the same data point to be pulled out twice. And then if we do this over and over again and keep calculating the, the average, say, for example, we get the distribution, we'll get an approximation to the sampling distribution of the average or whatever statistic we're looking at. So we're going to calculate the statistic for each simulated data set, and then we're going to use the simulated statistics to define a confidence interval, take standard deviation to calculate a, uh, a standard error of the statistic, and so on. So this is the so-called non-parametric bootstrap because we're, um, we're not using any sort of model. If you use a model or something like that, then you can get a different kind of bootstrap, maybe called the parametric bootstrap. Um, so the, um, so here's a bootstrap procedure for calculating the median of a set of n observations. Sample n observations with replacement, that's key, right, with replacement from the observed data resulting in one simulated complete data set. Take the median of this simulated data set, repeat these two steps, say b times, resulting in b simulated medians, and then these medians um, are approximately drawn from the sampling distribution of the median of n observations. So we can draw a histogram of them, calculate their standard deviation to get an approximate standard error of the median, calculate quantiles to get a confidence interval for the median. Neat idea. So let's just do this for um, an example of a median for the um, data set we were looking at before. Remember our data was just in a variable called x. Um, so um, here we're going to do a thousand bootstrap resamples and um, the function sample in um, R samples uh, with replacement if you put replace equals true and so I just want to you know I know that I want to sample n data sets from I want to grab n times b observations from this bag right and so I'm just going to tell it to go ahead and grab all n b of them and put it in one giant vector and then I'm going to stack them in a matrix that has bootstrap samples rows and data size columns so it's going to be like that so it's going to grab them all at once and then it's going to stack them up like that and then what I can do is for each row calculate the median and that's what this apply statement does and then now I have my collection of medians I can calculate the standard deviation of the medians and get my standard error of the median I can calculate the 0.25th and 97.5th uh, uh, quantiles and get a confidence interval for the median. So see, what's amazing about the bootstrap, right, is you know, getting a confidence interval for the median, theoretically, without doing the bootstrap, is actually kind of hard. You know, you have to learn a lot of statistical theory and things like that to, to get a good one. Um, and there's some other tricks. There's some tricks you can do. If the distribution is log symmetric, you can, you can do some norm, normal calculations on the log scale, for example, and then exponentiate an interval and get a confidence interval for the median. But, but by and large, you know, all of this is kind of hard to think about. The bootstrap you know, really liberates um, from the applied statistician all these issues of how can I sort of theoretically solve this problem. It, it, it opens up a world of well, you know, I, I can, you know, I can, um, I can now do all these things that I wasn't able to do previously. You know, um, so so a lot of any statistic that I can think of, I can try resampling. Now that's dangerous. It's a dangerous way of thinking because the bootstrap doesn't always work. And there's you know, um, you know, there's instances where it doesn't work well. Um, but nonetheless, the bootstrap was an incredibly liberating procedure in that it freed up the applied statisticians into being able to, to, to do all these things without having to spend lots of time um, deriving new, new standard error calculations, for example. So that, the bootstrap was amazing in that regard. Um, so one thing you almost always want to do if you go through the trouble of creating your bootstrap sample is just do a histogram and see what the sampling distribution, the approximated sampling distribution of your medians, in this case, or your statistic is. 
Um, so some notes on the bootstrap. The, the bootstrap is a non-parametric technique, at least the non-parametric bootstrap is. There's better percentile confidence intervals that correct for bias. And there's lots of variations on the bootstrap. And look at the book called An Introduction to the Bootstrap by Efron and Tipshrani is the, the classic uh, for that quantity. Let's go to one other resampling procedure in permutation tests. So consider com comparing two independent groups. And so we have um, in these um, four, what, what, one, two, four, six insect sprays, A, B, C, D, E, and F. And we want to compare them. And let's say we just want to pick two at a time and compare them. So here's our box plot. So one way to go about performing, you know, we could, we could do normal testing, we could do all these other things, but, but one, uh, one way that we could do this is consider the null hypothesis that the distribution of observations from group is the same. So, so in other words, that the spray is just a label and that label is irrelevant, right? That's the null hypothesis, that observations are exchangeable um, within levels of insect spray. So the group labels are irrelevant. Um, so what we could do is com combine the data, discard the group label, I'm sorry, discard the group labels, combine the data, and then permute the gr group labels and see what our, the distribution of our test statistic looks like if the labels are truly irrelevant. And then if our test statistic um, is, is extreme relative to that distribution, then that's um, suggesting the opposite, that the labels are important. So what we could do is split the permuted data into two groups with NA and NB observations, each of them. This could be um, executed by permuting the labels and evaluate the probability of getting a statistic as or large th than the one observed. Um, so we could just, for example, take the average difference between the, the, the groups or you could use a t-statistic. That's the benefit of these data resampling procedures is they give you a lot of flexibility uh, and it turns out that this, so this permutation procedure, it pops up in a lot of um, different contexts. So if you just do the raw data, it, you get an ordinary permutation test. If you have binary data and you do this, you wind up with so-called Fisher's exact test, um, depending on the test statistic you use, but variations on Fisher's exact test. And if you switch your data from the raw data to the ranks and you do the rank sum, then you wind up with the so-called rank sum test or Kruskal-Wallis. Um, or the Wilcoxon rank sum test, they all um, kind of involve permuting group labels. Um, so what we're talking about here is so-called permutation tests um, where we're saying there's a null hypothesis um, where that the permutations are irrelevant, the, the group labeling is irrelevant, and so we're going to calculate as our null distribution permutations of the group labels. There's another way of thinking about these tests is imagine if our group labels were randomized, if insect spray A was randomized to those insects and insect spray B was randomized to those in insects. So you could think of the possibility of, 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 of the permutation test being an example of kind of like conceptually redoing the randomization under the hypothesis that the treatment is irrelevant. And that, that sort of thinking about permutation test leads to something called so-called randomization test and because there was explicit randomization in the study design you're utilizing that for your inference it's a different it's a different way of thinking so I, I even though you're procedurally doing the same thing I think of randomization test and permutation test as conceptually very different things anyway so for match data you you randomize for match data um, if you have paired observations if you have you know observation one in group A and observation one in group B, observation one in group, uh, observation two in group A, observation two in group B, and so on, where these observations are paired. Um, it, when you take the difference, you get a sign, right? Plus one, minus one, minus one, plus one, and so on. As you, it, it, instead of, um, there's no group labels to permute because you've subtracted each pair. What you can do is, is randomly allocate the signs. So flip a coin for every sign. Um, and that's what you can do for um, um, match data. Um, and so you can, you can do permutation strategies and regression by uh, permuting a regressor of interest, um, uh, but the, you, have to, you have to be careful about um, 
about other aggressors. So, uh, so, uh, so if it's um, if it's just straight linear regression, then it's easy. But if there's confounders and other things, you have to be careful about that. Uh, and then permutation tests work very well in in multivariate settings. Um, okay. So um, let's do a permutation test. I I want to test um, whether or not. Uh, B and C are different. The insect sprays label B and C. Um, so um, I, I'm grabbing the, the only those those observations that received uh, sprays B or C, um, and then I'm going to get my Y is just the the outcome, the count, the number of dead insects, I presume. Um, uh, I, I want my group variable. I want it to be a character variable. I, I don't want it to be a factor variable. I don't know, just as a matter of preference right now. And then my test statistic is just um, if, if I have um, my um, outcome W and my group variable G, it's the mean difference between the B group and the C group. Okay? And so my observed test statistic is just my test statistic evaluated with the observed data Y um, with the observed grouping variable. And then my permutations are I'm just going to apply for a couple 10,000 times in this case. Um, instead of plugging in the group, my, my, my y's stay the same, but instead of plugging in the group variable, I permute the group variable. So here's my observed stat. And then here's the mean of the number, the percentage of the permutations that are bigger than my observed statistic. It turns out to be zero. So zero times out of 10,000 permutations of the group labels that I wind up with a statistic as large as my observed statistic. So that would suggest that the, the specific permutation that led to my observed data is kind of important, that it is that my statistic is, is, is very large. So my p-value in this case is zero, so that's about as small as a p-value as you can get. And here's my permutation distribution, as in all these cases you want to actually draw the distribution. And so, um, um, you know, what you're doing is this is a kind of a null distribution and you're looking for your statistic. Um, in this case our statistic is, is out there. Okay, so that's a couple of data resampling procedures. You'll see these popping up throughout the series um, in the machine learning class, um, and uh, in the uh, maybe a little bit in the regression class. Though probably we're going to cover more classical inference in the in the regression class. But these are incredibly handy tools. I would you know find I would end with a word of caution about you know being careful about using them, and um, you know they're the 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 they're very liberating as I said before in that you um, you know. Um, you can do them, and they, they apply in a very wide variety of settings. But, you know, just like the jackknife has this one kind of parsnickety instance where it doesn't work very well, you know, there's instances where all these things don't work very well, and it's, you know, um, so it takes some experience in using them to, to figure them out. Um, so, uh, but they are incredibly powerful tools, and they're very handy to kind of whip out of your pocket really quickly. Um, when you need to, to, to perform a test or get an uh, inference and you don't exactly know you know how to do it you know so off the top of your head you're not going to know um, a hypothesis test to do when your your observations have some funny looking distribution that you can't assume is normal or t or, or you can't use the t test or whatever um, but you can do a permutation test kind of quickly or you can you know get a bootstrap standard error kind of quickly um, so it is. There are extremely handy little things, um, but again, I would, you know, caution you to be uh, careful about them.